news, very sad news to tell the sports world. The LA Times is reporting that retired Los Angeles Lakers basketball star Kobe Bryant has been killed in a helicopter crash. Weather conditions deteriorated once again going into the weekend along the southeastern coast of Australia. A quarter of a million people. Restrictions on vaping products, the FDA banning the sale of most kinds of flavored e-cigarette cartridges. But the plan backs off of the more sweeping changes President Trump first proposed. And health officials say it doesn't go far enough to protect young people. Another round of key voting ahead on Tuesday. Six states are up for grabs with Michigan, of course, being the biggest prize. The campaign is now a clear two-man Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He is on the front lines here in the U.S. response to the coronavirus outbreak. Dr. Fauci, good morning. It's good to have your time, sir. Good morning. First of all, I mean, as we know, the World Health Organization just de de declared this a global health emergency. For Americans who are watching this, how serious is this? How serious is this? Coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Here's what we know. A Washington state resident fell ill after returning from Wuhan, China. And to the major disruptions across this country tonight. More signs of the world's biggest economy actually shutting down. Children home from school. Now eight states, as I mentioned, canceling school in their states. Empty shelves across this country at grocery stores. And more major sporting events have now been canceled. Throughout the country, more protests today from New York to California. Tens of thousands remembering George Floyd and demanding change. what's going on everybody hey guys what's up it's your boy ruben are you guys excited for this summit can i get a let's go in the chat let's go let's go whoop, whoop, whoop. so in today's summit we're going to be able to teach you guys the different and dangerous and deceptive tactics that big tobacco uses against communities here and it's gonna be a really good topic and we have so much good stuff planned for you guys, but it's important that you guys know the truth, take a stand and be vape for free. So now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off so that way you guys can get to see who's gonna be presenting to you guys in this summit. Hope you guys enjoy. Three, two, one. Here we go. Hi everyone. So it's your friendly neighborhood TA, uh, Dagan Smith, and I'm coming at y'all from Shepherd, Texas. My name is Max Castillo, and I'm from Brownsville, Texas. Hi everybody, Micah here. Welcome to vlog number two. Hello everyone, it's Ella, fresh out of the shower, fresh into a new year, and fresh into another vlog. Hi 
So really quickly, my name is Ruby Garza. I'm a consultant. College, I go to UT Austin. Welcome for life. What's up, everybody? I'm Dagan Smith, and I'm coming to you live from Shepherd, Texas. I'm 18 years old, and this is my third and final year as a Say What Teen Ambassador. With that being said, I'm super excited to be here with you today during our first 2021 summit. Hi, everyone. It's Max coming at you from the tip of Texas, Brownsville, and this is my first year as a TA, and I'm super excited to be here at the summit. Hey everyone, it's Micah. I'm a sophomore from McKinney, Texas. This is my first year as a teen ambassador and I'm so excited to be discussing how tobacco is a social justice issue with you this morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ella Troop. I'm a sophomore at Sinton High School in Sinton, Texas. I'm a second year teen ambassador and I'm super excited this summit started. Hey everyone, my name is Charlene Moore. I'm 16 years old. I'm a sophomore at Jefferson High School. This is my second wonderful year as a TA. And I'm like the other TAs, I'm super excited to be here and get excited because we're gonna be talking about some really cool stuff today. Hey guys, what's up? It's your boy Ruben again. I go to 10 Texas State University, eat them up cats. Woo! class of 2023 and I'm super excited to be here with you guys. Also, this is my second year as a consultant for the Say What program. Hi y'all, my name is Kiki. I am currently attending University of Texas at Austin. I'm about to graduate. I'm super excited about that, hooking for life. And I'm from El Paso, Texas. It is also my second year as a consultant in the team, as, in the Say What program. So I just wanted to start this summit off by thanking our staff at Texas School Safety Center for all the hard work you all put into this awesome presentation. So guys, this is definitely gonna be so much fun. So we definitely wanna make sure we get to keep up with you guys and all the things you do after this presentation to advocate for tobacco prevention. So make sure to connect with us on all of our social media. We have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, and even TikTok. And you can find us on all of those platforms at Texas Say What. Now, let's quickly talk about who we are and what we're doing here. So now that we're all here, what exactly is Say What? Say What's an organization that speaks and educates youth across Texas on vaping. So type in the chat if you know what Say What stands for. Well, if you... Students, adults, that's true. Um, if you guys really don't know, that's fine because I'm here to tell you. So it stands for Students, Adults, Youth Working Hard Against Tobacco. Say what's an organization made up of youth, adults, and students who are trying their best to educate their communities about the harmful effects of tobacco. There are so many great and fun components that make up Say What. One of them is our amazing teen ambassadors. As teen ambassadors, we work hard to give you the best possible information on tobacco prevention. And we do this through our blogs, summits like this one, and our conference. All right, fact, regardless of the reason, it was fun getting to know you a little bit. All right, thank you, Max. So great job, everyone. So first I'm going to ask you an icebreaker question and then we're gonna play a quick game. All right, so your question is, what part of Texas are you from? Let's see how much of the state we can cover. Everybody put it down in the chat. I see San Antonio, El Paso, Houston, South Texas, Wichita Falls, Joshua. I live very close to Joshua. Lufkin, Waxahachie, Corpus Christi. That is awesome. We have people from all over. That is pretty cool. I personally am from just north of Dallas and only about an hour away from Oklahoma. 
All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and play our game. For this game, I'm going to name a category and you're going to name as many things in that category as you can in 20 seconds. All right, so first I want you to name as many kinds of candy as you can. Ready, go. Skittles, Sour Patch, Starburst, Nerds, Snickers, Sour Patch, lots of Sour Patch, that is my favorite. <laughs> Jelly beans, Reese's, gummy bears. Gummy bears are also very good. Butterfingers, Crunch, Warheads. That is awesome. Great job. You guys named a lot of different kinds of candy. Okay, for this next category, I want you to name as many ice cream flavors as you can. What's the weirdest ice cream flavor you've ever had, ever seen? What's your favorite? Any flavor you can think of. Let's see, rainbow, birthday cake, mint. Pecan, wedding cake, strawberry, pistachio, chocolate, bubble gum. You've had cheese ice cream. Wow, that's that's kind of strange. I don't know if I'd eat that. Jerry Garcia, avocado, Texas two-step, lobster. They make a lobster ice cream? That's crazy. Good job, everybody. You came up with a lot, a lot of flavors. Okay, so now we're going to switch it up a little bit and instead of food I want you to name as many books as you can as many book titles as you can let's see how much people have read all right and um, let's see Harry Potter the Hunger Games Charlotte's Web the Bible Twilight Old Yeller the Fault in Our Stars the Last Olympian where the Red Fern Grows the Shining 1984 the Lightning Thief Pride and Prejudice that's my favorite mm-hmm Remember series, Animal Farm, a lot of Animal Farm all at once. Night, that is awesome. I have a, We have a pretty well-read group here, don't we? That is awesome. Okay, so this last one is kind of a hard one. Uh, you have 30 seconds to name as many colors as you can. And I don't wanna hear any of those boring normal ones like red, orange, yellow, green, blue, or purple. I wanna hear some fun ones like all the oddly specific crayon names. So let's see, sea foam green, periwinkle, fuchsia, violet, cyan, coral, mac and cheese, violet, peach, sunset red, aquamarine, chocolate, tan, banana yellow, indigo, burnt orange, sky blue, dolphin gray, violet, dragon red, citrine, charcoal, scarlet. That is awesome, you guys are coming up Red, didn't I specifically say not to say red? That is all right. You guys are doing so good. Eggshell, great job. That was so much fun. Thank you for playing. So now let's take a look at the topic of today's sun. All right, so today's summit is all about how tobacco is a social justice issue. We're going to talk about how big tobacco unfairly targets people of color women and the LGBTQ plus community. Now let's talk about what social justice means to you. All right, guys, we're gonna be using the chat again and I want you to type in the chat any images that pop into your mind when you hear the word social justice. So go ahead, put it in the chat for me. Human rights, me too, equal, the lamb, be a lamb, equality, pride, George Floyd, fair rights. Right, so I'm getting a lot coming in right now and those are all really great answers. But let's go ahead and take a look at the definition of social justice. Social justice is the view that everyone deserves equal economic, political and social rights and opportunities. Now you may be wondering, well, why is social justice important? Social justice is important because it promotes fairness and justice across all parts of society. It also promotes equal economic, educational, and workplace opportunities. And these are all super, super important. And now that we've taken a quick look at social justice, Dagan, can you tell us about health equity? Thank you, Ella. So yeah, as she said, I'm gonna talk about health equity. Now, first we're gonna take a look at this image. As you look at the group of people on the left, you can see that all three of them have the same size step to help them reach the apple. But you notice that only the tallest person is able to grab the apple. Type in the chat real quick if y'all if this seems fair to y'all. 
I see no's, no, no, not really, no. So yes, to me personally, this ain't fair. Uh, it may seem like it's fair because they were all given the same size step. So it seems like they all have the same opportunity to reach the apple. But that just isn't the case because the person in the middle needs a little bit more of a step to reach the apple. And the shortest person needs a much taller step to reach the apple. Now let's take a look at the people on the right. Because everyone is a different height, they all have different size steps giving them the opportunity to reach the apple. We take this example from this image and put it into a real world perspective. We are all created differently. We all come from different ethnic groups, different races, different religions, different sexual orientations, and different backgrounds. Therefore, we all need different resources to reach our full potential. Some may need more than others because that's the way that we're created. It is important to understand the difference between equality and equity. The terms are often used as the same, but they are not. Equality means that everyone, no matter their background, has an equal opportunity to realize their potential. It means giving everyone an equal opportunity to use their individual skills. But equity is the way policies are set up and the way resources are provided to everyone, no matter what your gender is, what your race is, your class, immigration status, language, sexual orientation, disability, and many other things. Equity focuses on fairness and the way that we do things and the effect that comes with fair treatment. Recognizing differences and making changes to help prevent the continuation of fairness. Health equity is when everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Long-standing systemic health and social imbalances have put many racial and ethnic minority groups at an increased risk of getting sick and dying. So you might be asking yourself, why is health equity important? Well, here's the actual definition of the health equity, and it's everyone has a fair and opportunity to live a long and healthy life. Uh, this process includes removing the difficulties that will impact the ability for everyone to have the best health as possible. Some things that might hinder this would be that of poverty, discrimination, the feeling of powerlessness, and the lack of proper health care. For everyone to have the fair chance of healthy living, we must achieve uh, and to attempt health equity. So now, now that we've talked about social justice and health equity, how do the two go together? If you think of steps on the ladder as resources, opportunities, and privilege, you can see how this picture represents an unfair situation. One person has all the steps, while the other person is missing some. This person that is missing some is struggling to reach the top because they do not have all the necessary resources and opportunities to reach the top. This image shows how health equity and social justice relates to each other. We can relate this back to how certain groups of people do not have uh, the resources needed to reach the best health as possible. Our next summit, we'll be talking about COVID-19. I'm sure that you've heard that the Black and Hispanic communities have the highest rates of uh, COVID because they have poor or no access to health care. So COVID-19 is a social justice issue because not everyone has all the steps in their ladder in order to receive care to overcome this virus. Right, so Dagan kind of mentioned a little bit about social justice, but what does it have to do with tobacco? Why is tobacco a social justice issue? Because we're all different. Different tobacco products affect everyone's health in different ways. Throughout this presentation, we're gonna go into depth about the different health effects in different groups of people. But for right now, just go ahead and put in the chat some ways you think tobacco products might affect people's health differently. Just anything you might've heard in past summits or you know, anything like that. Targeting minorities, asthma. Some might get cancer, you can become addicted to it. Right, so everyone actually has some really good ideas, you know, but let's talk about it a little bit more on the next slide. Many different groups naturally have higher risk than others. And when tobacco products are used, are used, those risks are likely to worsen. So for example, just due to genetics, African-Americans have the highest rates of blood pressure and when someone uses tobacco products, it makes their blood vessels narrow and their heart beat faster. 
causing their blood pressure to rise. So African Americans already naturally have high blood pressure rates. Now, when you add smoking to the equation, we're looking at a very dangerous situation. I mean, let's look at Asian Americans. They are 40% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes and smokers are likely to have an increased trouble with controlling those diabetes and an increase of getting type two diabetes. And not, it doesn't just stop at physical health. Smoking even increases mental health risk factors for the LGBTQ plus community. They are more likely to, likely to experience anxiety and mood disorders, more likely compared to straight people. And as we all know, the use of e-cigarettes causes anxiety. And this is quite ironic, right? Because these products are labeled as stress relieving and calming. But on this next slide, I'm gonna explain how all of this ties into social justice. For decades, the tobacco industry has targeted specific groups of people like the ones we were just talking about, leaving them to suffer the negative health consequences from using tobacco products. It doesn't even just affect those few groups we mentioned. It also affects youth, women, and Native Indians. So many different people are left to suffer from the health consequences of these tobacco products. And minorities are even put at a disadvantage to receive health care if they were to be having health problems due to smoking. But I won't say too much about this topic because that's exactly what Max is going to be talking about now. How has tobacco industry affected opportunities for optimum health? Well, the answer is quite simple. Big tobacco companies have been targeting minority groups like the ones mentioned before. On the next slide, we see how they do this. They do this through product, price, place, and promotion. Well, product, product design is meant to target specifically certain groups of people. Prices vary city to city, neighborhood to neighborhood to grab the attention of certain people from that area. Place, location, location, location. The location of a store or an item is important for us to get it sold. And promotion, these are the types of ads that we see and how and who they're targeted for. Well, well, now it's time to do an energizer, guys. So pull up your chat box. So this energizer is called Touch That. So I'll be naming a description of object so it can be a color or a feel. And you have 10 seconds to go look for that object where you are and type in the chat, chat box when you're done. So the first object you're gonna have to look for is something blue. Your timer starts now, 10, nine, eight, well, I see people already finished it. You guys are super fast. Okay. The second thing is something warm. Your timer starts now. 10, nine. Oh. <laughs> Some people are saying their pet, their coffee, their sweater, computer, sun. Okay. The third object is something white. Ready, set, go. Your timer starts now. 10. Nine, you guys are already finishing so fast. My gosh, okay, a paper envelope, hair. <laughs> okay, your final, your final object is something cold in your room. Your timer starts now, 10, nine, eight. You guys are finishing so fast. Well, okay, so thank you all for participating. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about marketing tactics. Tobacco industry uses several marketing tactics to target specific groups to use their products. Tobacco companies have been known to sponsor cultural events, target direct mail promotions, place advertising in magazines, billboards, and venues that are popular with certain audiences like the mall. But this isn't cheap, it's really expensive, right, Micah? Right, yeah, believe it or not, the tobacco industry spends 26 million each day on marketing in the US. That's insane, that's 26 million a day just in the United States. So now let's take a look at what they use this money for. All right, they use this money to study and target buyers. Let's check out this quote. First generation Asians are important because they represent potential new smokers. Big Tobacco has been studying and targeting Asian Americans since 1988. After extensive research into Asian American culture, the Philip Morris Tobacco Company produced three techniques to target Asian Americans, which we'll cover in a minute. Type in the chat box if you know which brand of cigarettes Philip Morris is known for. Let's see, what do you guys think? 
What are they known for? Camel, I see Camel, Marlboro, Marlboro, Bergen Slims, Camel. You guys are right. They are known for their Marlboro. All right, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Here's a picture of some Marlboro cartons so you can kind of see how they're packaged. Okay, um, a tobacco executive stated that Asian American populations would be a profitable target due to their culture's genetic predisposition to smoking. Although we are based in America, China has the highest rate of tobacco use in the world, and Asians are the most prevalent tobacco users in the world. Big Tobacco uses this statistic to target Asians because of their cultural background. Okay, now let's cover those techniques we mentioned earlier. The first of the three techniques that Big Tobacco uses to target Asian Americans is the push strategy. The push strategy focused on training the Philip Morris employees with what they called sensitivity programs. These made them more aware of the Asian culture so they could seem more approachable to Asian retailers. These companies also created special retail materials to help Asian American retailers. They also created business to business programs where they supported Asian American business associations. Okay, the second strategy was called the pull strategy. The pull strategy was aimed at consumer development. Big Tobacco targeted the six largest Asian communities, the Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, Filipino, and Asian Indian communities, by hosting promotional events that appeal to youth and by using culturally sensitive advertising. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see out of the 10 countries with the most interference from the tobacco industry, Japan, one of the cultures targeted by Big Tobacco, is number one. All right, so now let's take a look at the last strategy. The third strategy was the corporate goodwill strategy, which concentrated on building community support so that the Asian American community would prefer the Philip Morris brand to any other brand. They also met with community leaders and elected officials to develop a preferred status for the Philip Morris brand. Marlboro is known for the Marlboro man, who is a cowboy. As you can see, they changed their character a bit by replacing him with an Asian cowboy near the Great Wall of China to make him more relatable to their Asian customers. Now let's talk about another way Big Tobacco targets Asian Americans. All right, the tobacco industry sponsored Asian American community festivals, such as the Lunar New Year festivals, and advertised in magazines in East Asian communities. Lung and bronchial cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths among Asians. Both of these can be caused by using tobacco. Ella, why don't you tell us a little bit about advertising tactics today? Thank you so much, Micah. And like she just said, I'm going to be talking about how Big Tobacco is targeting Asian Americans today. And despite all that Micah told us, Asian Americans have the lowest tobacco use rates compared to other groups. However, there are some differences in youth rates within the Asian American community itself. What's interesting is that urban Asian communities have more tobacco related billboards and stores compared to other urban communities. Now that we've talked about Asian Americans, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about American Indians. The tobacco industry appropriates American Indian culture and marketing while infiltrating value traditions to promote tobacco use. A great example of this are American Spirit cigarettes, which are a brand of cigarettes that you can see on your screen to the very left. And they target this group with their name packaging, logo, everything. Speaking of smoking, American Indian and Alaska Native high schoolers have the current highest smoking rate at 16.2%. As for e-cigarettes, that number goes up all the way to 40.4% which might have something to do with the fact that Juul targeted at least eight American Indian tribes with discounts and referral programs. Dagan, can you tell us about the Hispanic and Latinx community now? Thank you, Ella. Yes, so we're gonna uh, dive right into talking about the tobacco and Hispanic slash Latinx community. So this is a direct quote from RJ Reynolds. Spanish speaking consumers are extremely loyal to brands advertised to them, and they can be expected to be loyal forever. Put down in the chat if you know what RJ Reynolds is known for. 
let's see rj reynolds what do we know him for camel tobacco yes camel camel i'm seeing a lot of camels deceit i like that john uh so i see a lot of camels and yes they're known for newport camel and Paul mall and here's some advertisements up on the screen of their newport camel and Paul mall brand but do y'all know something different about these versus the one that you've seen earlier these are all written in spanish why so they could target specifically the hispanic and latinx community so i want to talk about another study uh, that rj reynolds did Back in 1982, R.J. Reynolds constructed a study to learn about the typical Hispanic. In their study, they wrote stuff like they're cultural and proud, family-oriented, traditional, prefer name brands, pays more attention to Spanish-oriented advertisements. Tobacco companies have continuously infiltrated the Latino community by paying tobacco merchants to display tobacco companies and sponsor their Latino cultural events provide scholarships to those who need it, and make contributions to the Latino political action committees. And after the study was done over the typical Hispanic for RJ Reynolds, they decided to come up with another program, a 1990 Camel Hispanic program. They stated that Hispanic consumers will enjoy and appreciate Camel's identification of their culture, specifically music, and will positively acknowledge Camel's presence within their culture. They came up with the, this 90, 1990 Camel Hispanic program, which was led by RJ Reynolds to try to integrate into the Hispanic community. They even made a marketing plan to place Camel advertisements in places that are popular amongst the Hispanic community, like markets, community events, and Hispanic concerts. RJ Reynolds came up with a second campaign targeting the Hispanic ages from 18 to 24 which has been called the Smooth Moves Hispanic Program. This program was a 14 week tour with 98 events in 10 Hispanic markets. So not only have they tried to integrate into their community, but now they're trying to politically motivate them as well. So Big Tobacco has been donating money to organizations, community leaders, and other local political leaders to provide positive messages of their brand in the Hispanic community. Philip Morris and RJ Reynolds gave the US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce over $75,000 in 1994. That same year, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce mailed over 92,000 letters urging business owners to lobby against a proposed tax increase. They were attempting to change the outcome of this tobacco tax increase by using the Hispanic community. Put in the chat box, how does this make you feel? How does it make you feel that tobacco companies would donate, quote unquote, their money to communities who need it, but in return, try to politically motivate them? I see disgusted, furious, angry, mad, disgusted. I totally agree. It is disgusting that big tobacco would use this community as a pawn for their political gain. So I wanna talk about how this is a social justice and health equity issue from earlier and how it's affecting the Latinx community. So today the e-cigarettes are the most commonly used tobacco products amongst the Latino high school and middle school students. This is very important because more than 43,000 Latino Americans are diagnosed with tobacco related cancer each year. And this results in 18,000 deaths. So as I just said, this is a health equity issue, but the way that big tobacco targets this community makes it a social justice issue as well. Right, so Dagan has talked about how Big Tobacco targets the Latino population, and I'm gonna talk about how they target the LGBTQ plus community. Tobacco companies have been targeting this community since the 1990s. They have made advertisements to depict tobacco products to be a normal part of the LGBTQ plus life. Members of the community are commonly discriminated against and they tend to face lack of representation. Tobacco companies are taking advantage of this problem by representing them in tobacco ads, trying to get the LGBTQ plus to support companies that claim to support them. If you look at the slide, you can see two of those ads clearly targeting the LGBTQ plus community. 
Tobacco industries have hosted giveaways and events furthering their work to target the community. But as we can all assume, they didn't stop there. This is a reoccurring problem that is still happening till this day. As you see on this slide, even 32% of people who identify as LGBTQ plus use e-cigarettes. And that is just the result of big tobacco targeting this community by funding scholarships, organizations, and even pride parades. It is honestly so shocking to see, but this targeting doesn't just stop at the LGBTQ plus community. Tobacco has even targeted women, which Max is gonna do an amazing job explaining the history of that. So thank you, Charlene. Tobacco marketing targeted towards women started back in the 1920s, so about 100 years ago. Some of the very first advertisements that were geared towards women mentioned weight loss as a reason to smoke. Some brands like Virginia Slims came up with cigarette marketed exclusively for women. Philip Morris targeted women by doing promotions in exchange for purchasing Virginia Slim cigarettes, including V-wear catalogs with blouses, coats, scarves, and accessories. In 2007, R.J. Reynolds came up with a cigarette geared towards women called Camel Number no. 9. Camel Number no. 9? Sounds familiar. Chanel Camel. Oh, Chanel Number no. 5, a luxury perfume brand. This, all this gave women perception that cig smoking cigarettes is a luxury. Because of smoking, lung cancer deaths have outnumbered breast cancer deaths in women since 1987. And about 62,000 women die each year because of smoking-related cardiovascular disease. But Big Tobacco takes advantage over breast cancer awareness. On the next slide, there's some pictures of ads. Well, breast cancer is one of the most common types of cancer in women. In the United States, Big Tobacco has been using this statistic to target women to using their products. And it can be seen in the e-cigarette ads on your screen. Now, Ella, one of our TAs, will give her thoughts on these breast cancer awareness ads. Right. Thank you so much, Max. And this is actually one of the biggest reasons that I applied to become a teen ambassador. My mom had breast cancer, and she's been in remission for over five years. But the pain and suffering she endured is something that I would never wish on someone and their loved ones. Now, my mom's cancer was in no way preventable, but the mouth, throat, and lung cancers caused by using cigarettes and e-cigarettes are. So it really disgusts me that these brands and companies are supporting breast cancer awareness while knowingly causing many other types of cancer. Back to you, Max. Thank you, Ella, for sharing your story. Well, currently 18.8% of high school students, females use e-cigarettes. On the next slide, there's a quote from Newport and it reads, the base of our business is a high school student. This quote is directly from Newport. Type in the chat if you know what flavored tobacco product Newport makes. I see some, some people are saying menthol. I, like menthol is like really big thing that I see people and you guys are correct. Menthol cigarettes is flavored cigarettes is something that Newport makes. Well, now, how does this make y'all feel? Type in the chat below. Well, I, for me, it made me feel very mad, like exactly this courage, making me want to die upset. And I agree with all this. I have every single same feeling. Well, now, Micah's going to talk a little bit more about tobacco, youth and tobacco. All right, thank you, Max. Okay, believe it or not, Eight out of 10 youth who vape started with a flavored product. Big Tobacco has been targeting youth for years. Tobacco companies use colorful packaging and flavors to try and lure youth in to use their products. Let's take a look at some examples. All right, type in the chat if you love ice cream. I know I do, and I'm pretty sure most of you do too. Big Tobacco knows this and uses it to their advantage. This picture isn't actually ice cream. It's an e-cigarette liquid that looks exactly like ice cream. One tactic that Big Tobacco uses is packaging their products to look similar to products that appeal to youth, like candy and gum. Let's take a look at some more examples. All right, so in these photos, you can see how e-cigarette companies purposefully package their products to look like the food items that we like. These e-cigarette liquids look exactly like popsicles, whipped cream, and apple juice. Along with packaging their products like food, they also try to make their products look like everyday items. 
Thank you, Micah. And I want you all to go ahead and open the chat again. And I want you to type in if you have seen any of these products before. So just go ahead and put a quick yes or no in the chat. If you say no, that's okay, because I'm going to tell you about them now. These right here on screen are Soaring Vape products, and Soaring has quickly grown in popularity through their use of nicotine salts and appealing shapes and colors. On the left, you can see that the Soaring drop looks just like the Mio water enhancers. And on the right, you can see that the Soaring Vagon closely resembles highlighters. Now, highlighters are used by most aged youth, and the Mio water enhancers are a common food product. So it's very clear that Soaring is trying to make their products seem fun, tasty, and normal by modeling them after everyday items like highlighters and food products like the Mio water enhancers. Let's go ahead and switch gears a little bit to talk about disposables. On the screen, you can see Mojos and Puff Bars. But what makes these different from other types of e-cigarettes is that they're disposable, meaning that the user can only use them one time before they have to throw them away. Just like non-disposables, these brands have risen in popularity through their use of appealing shapes, colors, and flavors. Juul has done a lot of damage to youth with their highly addictive products. And although they're trying to clean up their mess now, the damage has already been done. Companies like Mojo, Puff, and Soaring are modeling their products after everyday items, using appealing shapes, and using appealing colors just like Juul did. Speaking of Juul, let's go ahead and take a look at some of their dirty laundry. For starters, Juul awarded scholarships to incoming college freshmen if they wrote essays discussing the health benefits of vaping. They also paid $134,000 to sponsor a five-week holistic health education summer camp that recruited from grade three through 12. They also paid schools to use their curriculum and made me false health. Okay. Now that we talked about, I want you to open up the chat again and type in your favorite type of social media. Let's go ahead and put it in Pinterest, Instagram, talk, TikTok, Instagram. All right, seeing a lot of great chat, and these are all really great, except for that the most common flat platforms to hear about these products are on social media. Let's watch a quick video. Right, so that was a really great little video illustrating this and these types of mobile ads have the potential to reach millions of young people. There is some good news though. In December of 2019, both Instagram and Facebook banned paid advertisements from their sites. And although that is a great first step, there's still plenty of free advertisements. Just think of someone you know who vapes on social media. On this next slide, you can see two examples of this. And although these aren't paid ads, they still have the same effect as paid ads. Every time somebody vapes on social media, it adds a free advertisement on top of the billions that these companies already spent. The fact is, youth who vape are twice as likely to smoke cigarettes in the future. With that, let's watch a quick video. All right, hold on. First, we're gonna do an energy check. All right, who is ready for an energizer? For this energizer, we're going to play charades. So I am going to direct message Ella a word and she's going to act it out. So I want you guys to pull up the chat and you are going to try to guess what Ella is miming, what she's doing. All right, Ella, you have your word. Thank you so much, Micah. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead and start. Like she said, don't forget to put in the chat 
Um, your guess, the very first person to guess correctly will receive some say what swag. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. <laughs> You got it. Peeling a banana. It was banana peel, but peeling a banana is perfect. Okay, so now we're going to do one more. I'm going to chat Micah her word, and then you're going to do the same thing. Same thing. Let's see who can get this word first. All right, ready, guys? Let's see. Close. People are getting close in the chat. Oh my goodness, you guys got that one fast. Let's see, two people said karate so quickly. That is awesome. Good job, guys. All right, guys, I hope you all had fun with that. And with that, we're going to go ahead and get right back into the presentation. Now we'll watch the video. For decades, big tobacco targeted minorities with menthol cigarettes. Here's some of what they did. Identified and profiled black communities. More than 75% of African-American smokers use menthols. Appropriated black culture. Flooded the neighborhood. Can't get away from it. It's all around us. This addiction was designed. We grow cigarette volume, and that's all we did. And today, 89% of African-American smokers use menthols. Know the truth, spread the truth. All right, everybody, go ahead and get that chat box back out real quick because I need some help. What have we talked about today? Uh, we've talked about big tobacco and how they've targeted Asian Americans, Native Americans, the Hispanic and Latinx community, the LGBTQ plus community, women and the youth. And now we're going to dive right into talking about how big tobacco has targeted the African American community. So tobacco companies have intentionally targeted the black community with their menthol cigarettes for years. And this is why nearly nine in 10 black smokers use menthol products. Being specifically targeted by big tobacco has made this a social justice issue for the black community. So now we're gonna dive into the African-American community and menthol. So, African-Americans and, uh, and menthol, predominantly black communities have more advertising than uh, and cheaper menthol cigarettes. Uh, tobacco companies can do this by placing more ads in black neighborhoods and appropriating their culture in the markets. Like mentioned earlier, Big Tobacco has sponsored events that are common within the black community like jazz concerts and hip hop festivals. African-Americans have more of a nicotine dependency and a greater desire to smoke than non-menthol smokers. This makes it where the African-American community has a harder time quitting. Big Tobacco knows the demographics and they use that to their advantage. For instance, low income communities and minority communities are less likely to be affected by smoke-free policies because Big Tobacco has made large contributions to politically motivate black leaders and politicians to protect themselves against local policies that would otherwise hinder their marketing. So you might be asking me, how does this really go with the social justice and health equity? Well, here on the screen, seven out of 10 African-American middle and high school students smoke menthol cigarettes compared to the five out of 10 white students. So to kind of put this in perspective, Newports have become the number one brand of menthol cigarettes in the United States. And unsurprisingly, the number one brand amongst the black community. Almost 95% of African-American youth who smoke choose menthol. And they're able to do this with all their advertising by the price of the Newports decreasing, which allows the promotions to increase. So Dagan just spoke about how menthol cigarettes have been targeted to the African-American community, but things aren't any different with e-cigarettes and vapes. And you can thank Jewel for that. They directly targeted Black youth by funding after-school programs that have mostly Black participants. As you can see on the next slide, almost 18% of African-American high school students 
and 9% of African American middle school students faith. Take a minute and think about those numbers. African Americans have the highest rate of tobacco related cancers out of all racial and ethnic groups, and they are most likely to die because of the disease. With that being said, more than 72,000 African Americans are diagnosed with a tobacco related cancer each year. I mean, look at everything going on this year. Well, everything that has been going on for a long time were brought to attention this year. This is just another injustice being added onto everything else. I mean, when can we catch a break? How much more injustice do we have to endure before we speak on it? It's long overdue, and that's why we're here today. Keep everything I've said in mind as we watch this very important video. This is what Big Tobacco said about the black community, read by the black community. We don't smoke the shit, we just sell it. We reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. Young blacks have found their thing, and it's menthol. Smoking and health is of little concern to the African people, and it seems not to be a popular issue among them. Big Tobacco has spoken. Now it's our turn. So before I say anything, go ahead and open that chat box back up and just go ahead and put in there how that video might have made you felt. Yeah, so basically, this is just very upsetting. It's honestly so crazy. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you guys how I feel. To me, this absolutely infuriates me. I mean, members of the African American community, my community, are constantly adding up to those breathtaking statistics that we mentioned earlier because Big Tobacco intentionally targets African Americans. Obviously not having the human decency to even care about the people they're putting in danger. Enough is enough and I'm sure we can all agree. Right, so um, today we have an amazing guest speaker who will share even more information with us about how the tobacco industry has targeted the black community and he is Dr. Philip Gardner. Dr. Gardner is a public health activist, administrator, evaluator, and researcher. For the past 25 years, he has worked on a variety of health issues, including hypertension, multiculturalism, AIDS, breast cancer, prostate cancer, diabetes, and smoking. For the past 20 years, Dr. Gardner has lectured around the country on African-American health disparities and menthol smoking in the Black community. Dr. Garner recently retired as a senior program officer for the Tobacco Related Disease Research Pro Program at the University of California Office of the President, a position he had been since 1997. Dr. Garner is currently the co chair of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, which is a group of Black professionals dedicated to fighting the plague of tobacco and has and is impacting African American communities in California and all across the country. This is all so cool and inspiring. I couldn't be more excited to hear from Dr. Gardner today. Real quick, open up that chat box, put a couple of round of applause and some let's goes because we are all so excited to hear from him. Let's all give a warm welcome to Dr. Philip Gardner. Good morning, Dr. Gardner. We are so excited to hear from you today. Look, thank you for having me. So Dr. Gardner, like I said, we are all super, super excited to hear from you today. Um, I'm sorry, you guys, just one second. Maybe I should just give a little background while you kind of figure it out. Yes, please. Um, um, I, let me just say to the folks in the audience, thank you for being here and um, having me. Um, usually I would do a, usually a, something like a 40 minute or so, 45 minute or so presentation on the the targeted marketing of the tobacco industry of African Americans in the United States, which has been going on for um, over 50 years. I guess the short story is that coming out of World War II, the tobacco industry, um, coming out of World War II, Black folks moved to the North, many of them, most of them, 
in segregated situations and different companies took advantage of that situation and developed specific products for them, whether it was different hair creams for them or foodstuffs like Uncle Ben's rice and stuff like that proliferated in the late 40s and early 50s. The, there was a um, survey done in 1953 that found that only 5% of African Americans smoked menthol cigarettes. And then after a series of focus groups done by Brown and Williamson in the late 50s, found that African Americans resonated with TV commercials and the messages that were in them um, much more than um, white folks. Um, I mean, literally we have data on this. Once they figured that out, they began to employ African Americans in TV ads, um, in newspaper, and particularly magazines, Jet, Ebony um, magazines. You have to remember this is, the, this is during the time of the civil rights movement when blacks weren't even allowed to sit at lunch counters or get jobs. And indeed in 1963, um, Elston Howard, the um, catcher for the New York Yankees was on a number of them um, uh, printouts about um, the, you know, pushing um, menthol cigarettes. This is a time where the tobacco industry is hiring black um, executives in North Carolina. And at the same time, this is a time when the Birmingham um, um, church is being blown up or the March on Washington is taking place. So the tobacco industry is a, way ahead of the curve, way ahead of the curve. They began to use more black folks with more black features. By the early 70s, they had folks with afros and dashikis. They had basketball ads. By the 80s, there were the menthol wars, meaning that most of the tobacco industry, different brands, Cools, Camels, Benson and Hedges, Marlboro's, everybody came out with the menthol brand. By the 90s, they began to even develop cigarettes that were specifically targeted cigarettes for, for black people. There was Uptown cigarette that was created. There was X brand cigarette that was created. There was, there was the, for lack of a better term, there was the Black Joe Camel that was created. This, this is, the punchline is if it was 5% in 1953, it almost tripled to 14% by 68. It had tripled again by 1976. And today we're at 85, more than 85% of African Americans who smoke cigarettes smoke menthol cigarettes. And that's because of the predatory marketing of the tobacco industry. Okay, thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Gardner. Sorry about the wait. Um, so we're gonna start with our first question and that is, why did you decide to focus your career on public health activism? especially how the tobacco industry targets the African-American black community? I think that's probably the most important question. Um, in the 1960s, I was part of the um, black liberation movement, um, the civil rights movement. Um, I was in college at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, involved in creating the black studies program there, got involved in the um, the, the, the Black Student Union there. Um, I've been a political activist my entire life. That was in 68. Um, today I'm 71 years old and I've continued that activism. Um, I think the punchline to all of this of doing political work um, throughout my life, um, I ended up working at the University of California, San Francisco, most of the 80s. And the data, the, the, the data, the research that we mainly did was looking at the impact of um, certain social situations on different groups of people. Punchline being that one of the studies we did looked at bus drivers who were predominantly Filipino and African American and showed that driving the bus essentially raised your blood pressure and made you more tense and produced more cortisol in your system and et cetera. Following that experience, I went back to school and got my master's degree and my doctorate degree. Um, and 
I was living in a certain place in Oakland, California and driving, you know, 25, 30 miles to a job in southern part of the of Alameda County. And the job came up announcement that they were looking for a program officer in tobacco. And after just a little research, finding that African Americans died disproportionately of tobacco related diseases, I, I said, ah, oh, I can continue my quote unquote political activism through public health work. Um, I guess the real defining moment was in 1998 when the um, Surgeon General's report came out, the first one on um, looking at um, health disparities um, for different um, race and ethnic populations. And I'm sitting at my desk at the university, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm page after page after page after page is about how black people are dying disproportionately from stroke, disproportionately from lung disease, disproportionately from um, coronary heart disease. Um, and it just went on and I was like, wow. And then when you, not to put too sharp of a point on it, most of that was from smoking. From then on, I've been focused. And then when I dug into it deeper, what were black folks smoking? They were smoking menthol cigarettes. So then I kind of, I currently work with the, the um, African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. We were formed immediately before the um, FDA took control of tobacco products. And of course, as you all know, um, there are 13 flavors excluded from um, cigarettes. The only one that was left in was menthol. It was straight up racist. It was unfair. And we have been fighting against it ever since. Currently, you should be aware that my group is suing the Food and Drug Administration for them dragging their feet of not making a ruling on menthol. Um, I think I'm getting close to answering your question. <laughs> um, so let me, let me stop there. Um, no, that, that's very interesting to hear. And I definitely agree, like how blankly obvious it is what their goal was by not banning menthol as well as all the other flavors. That's really interesting to hear about. Also, um, for any attendees or any other participants, um, if you guys get any questions while we are asking and talking with Dr. Gardner, be sure to um, put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box, so we might be able to ask Dr. Gardner your question. Okay, so on to our next question. How can we help advocate for other communities of color or the LGBTQ plus community against the tobacco industry? Well, you guys are probably, probably aware of this. Um, they target each community specifically, whether they're gonna have ads in Spanish that um, attract the Latinx community, um, you know, or the whole thing they did with women, um, with, you know, the, the slimmer, trimmer um, cigarettes and stuff like that. So they, they, they're pretty straightforward on it. I guess what was most alarming and, you know, I guess it pisses me off essentially, is they launched the SCUM project. And many of you are aware of the SCUM project. SCUM project was um, subcultural urban marketing and that was focused on um, LGBTQ folks, particularly in San Francisco, but in, in other parts of the country. And then they, what, what's interesting to me, it took them you know, a few months to realize, oh, Scum Project is, is, is prejudicial and we should call it something else. So they began to call it Sourdough Project. Um, but they, they have targeted specialty products to special groups all the time. And that's what they do. Unfortunately, it's had quite a um, devastating effect on the African American community, but they target other communities. Let me just say people that are interested in um, in dealing with in their community against the tobacco industry is that you have to get in there personally and see how they're doing the advertising. Let me, let me tell you what they do in the black community. Um, the cigarette, there are more advertisements for menthol cigarettes in African American communities compared to other communities. There are more lucrative promotions um, in the African American community compared to other communities. And I guess what pisses me off the most is that cigarettes are cheaper in the African American community. 
in other places. So here the most, you know, the people that are very oppressed um, are getting their death sticks cheaper. Um, it's, it's, frankly, it's outrageous and disrespectful, so. I, I totally agree. It's, it's honestly so crazy. It, they don't even try to conceal the targeting at this point. It's insane. Um, but obviously, you know, you're very knowledge on tobacco and all of that. So what was the impact of tobacco on your life or family when you were in high school? Hmm. I, I saw that question. Um, so in high school, folks should um, be aware I was in Oakland. I went to high school from um, 65 through 67. I lived in Oakland, California. I was a basketball player. I didn't smoke cigarettes. Um, and I, of course, you know, I tried it with my friends sometimes, but it was like, oh, these are terrible. <laughs> um, by the time I got to college at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, I played my freshman year. Um, and I got an injury in my um, sophomore year and had to in my basketball career, then I started hanging out with folks in the Black Student Union. And when I started smoking, this would probably be in the spring of 19, um, let's tell this lie right, <laughs> in the spring of 1969, um, I was smoking Winston cigarettes. Um, Winston tastes good like a cigarette should, you know, and like that. By the time I started attending regular um, Black Student Union meetings in the fall of 69, um, <clears throat> I was smoking um, cool cigarettes. And it became clear on, through that summer and the work we had been doing in the community in Santa Barbara that when we would take a break, you know, everybody would pull out a pack of cigarettes. I was the only one who didn't have a cool cigarette. And that's how the marketing got to me. Um, it was through my friends and et cetera. I remained a cool smoker until 1987 when I quit smoking. Um, but that, that was, that was I, I didn't, I, fortunately I was an athlete in high school and um, I didn't, I, you know, sure I took a, a hit now and then, but it was like, this is terrible. I don't have anything to do with it. But then the cool, I mean, that's the whole point of why they put menthol in um, <clears throat> cigarettes. Look, menthol is an anesthetic by definition. It allows you for deeper inhalation. The more nicotine and toxins you take in, the more addicted you become, the more addicted you become, the harder it is to quit. And we have data on all of this. I mean, menthol inhibits the metabolism of cotinine in your liver. Cotinine is the, um, what, menth uh, what, what nicotine turns into when it gets to your liver. If you smoke menthol cigarettes, it slows down the metabolism of the, um, of the nicotine that stays in your body longer. Take it even further. It's the darker the color of your skin, the more nicotine stays in your body, or what, what we call melanin. Um, the melanin is what gives us all color. Um, and if you keep, if you smoke cigarettes, um, nicotine stays in the melanin. The other thing um, menthol happens is what we call greater cell permeability. Greater cell permeability means that if you smoke a um, cigarette product that has menthol in it, it uh, crosses the cell membrane much more efficiently than if it doesn't have it in it. So when you begin to add all these different things up, it stays in your body longer, it's greater cell permeability. There's even another factor we've compared. There's studies that show um, that folks that smoke menthol cigarettes um, have what we call more nicotine receptors in their brain, meaning the menthol creates a more, more, more they're more addictive. I mean, you know, in a, in a lecture, I could kind of go over this in a little bit more detail, but um, they're more addictive, they're harder to quit, um, they stay in your body longer. It's a setup, it's a straight up setup. Yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. 
Our next question is <clears throat> from an attendee. And the question is, considering everything going on to advance social and racial, racial justice, how do we support these efforts while still maintaining focus on tobacco? How have these communities prioritized tobacco control compared to other relevant issues in the spotlight today? It's a great question. Um, this is the way we kind of put it. Menthol cigarettes and flavored little cigars are the main vectors of death and disease into the Black community. With the COVID-19 crisis, um, the COVID-19 crisis has exposed the underlying discriminatory nature of the history of the United States such that different groups don't have the same uh, resources and access that other groups have. If there's anything that we could do now to make Black Lives Matter more um, and to save Black lives, by the way, that's the tagline of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, saving Black lives, is to get menthol cigarettes and flavored little cigars straight out of the Black community. In fact, during this time, we've been able, during this time, during the pandemic, we've been able to pass legislation um, and particularly at the local level, um, restricting the sale of these products and making that argument that, and let's not get too into details, but smoking is exacerbates um, COVID-19 and makes it make you more susceptible. Indeed, if you're someone who has COPD or you're a smoker, then you actually produce receptors in your lungs that attract the coronavirus. This is a great publication in the, um, in the um, European Union uh, Respiratory uh, Disease um, Journal that actually documents this. Um, so yeah, yeah you, there's a way to integrate this. Um, if you wanna save black lives and black lives matter, then let's get these cigarettes and get these menthol cigarettes out of our community. That's how you tie them together. I wish they weren't tied together, but they're tied together like a knot. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, our, we have another question from an attendee and it is, as the knowledge of targeted marketing is made more evident, do you see that there is a change in this situation? I, I saw that and I, I, I must admit, I did kind of look at the chat now and then. Um, this actually came up in another meeting earlier this week that I was in and it was a similar phrase. There's, there's almost an assumption that now that it's been exposed for so many years, they're not doing it anymore. And that's just not true. All of those things, it's still cheaper. There's still more promotions. There's still more advertising. Um, there are coupons being given away. They're being promoted in black magazines. If anything, it has intensified. What is really, and I, I, I should have the more of the specifics here, I guess what has been really pissing me off is that the tobacco industry has been giving money to black organizations to fight COVID. <laughs> they're, they're just opportunists at the core. Um, let, let me make sure I get this out there because this may not be asked. The question would be, why did they leave menthol out of it in the first place? Was it just straight up racist? And um, I mean, wh wh why, why menthol? Why are we having the, why am I even here talking with you about it? I guess the punchline is this, that generally speaking, I guess these are 2018 data that the tobacco industry is somewhere in the neighborhood of a $221 billion industry. $221 billion industry. If you go to the FT, um, the Food and Drug Administration, no, the um, Free Trade um, 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 Commission and look up and just type in FTC and menthol, they'll send you to charts seven and eight. And the punchline there is 36% of all cigarette products sold in the United States are menthol. Um, and that's actually rising. That's even larger than it was in 2009 when they um, let it stay on the market, the, meaning that you're talking about, this is a $70 billion industry that these folks are into. Um, 
they're not. They're, the Congress wasn't about to do this. And unfortunately, some members of the tobacco control movement agreed with that um, quote unquote compromise um, in 2009 that um, made this all possible. So um, now, let me, let me, let me, let me stop. No, you're, you've been giving so much like good and interesting information. Um, moving on to our next question, we kind of talked about how, um, mar how marketing is today, how it's been targeted to different groups, but how did the tobacco industry target youth when you were our age? What was the advertising or targeted marketing like when you grew up? I thought that was an interesting um, comment. Um, since I look, my, my I, I wasn't a smoker, so I, I wouldn't I didn't pay much attention to it. Um, I think what's true is both my parents smoked, um, and obviously I was exposed to uh, tobacco smoke all my childhood. My mother quit in um, 1963. I guess I was about 14 years old then. Um, but my father smoked until he died in 1977. In fact, there was a pack of cigarettes by his, by his bed um, when he passed. And of course, he passed of a heart attack and just from, from smoking cigarettes. So it had an impact on me. I didn't, I must admit, and I apologize for being a young man, being ignorant about it. I didn't pay much attention to tobacco advertising then, but truth be told. Yeah, we completely understand. Most most kids our age don't even really notice it now either because it's so common. It's basically normalized at this point. So it's not really anything that sticks out unless you're interested like us, you know, and you're and you kind of talk about it all the time. Sometimes us and the TAs would send each other advertisements we see around in public and you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> like do you see this? But if you're not really thinking about it and at, you know actively have it on your mind and sometimes it just, you just pass by it and don't even notice it. Yeah. We actually have another question from an, an attendee. Um, I think it was in regards to your last question. And um, she asked which organizations took funding from the tobacco industry for COVID-19? Um, I don't have the, 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 the distinct data in front of me, but um, the tobacco industry gave over a million dollars away in Philadelphia to three notable black organizations. And I could look at, you guys can look that up. Um, and this is to help them fight COVID-19 and to fight racism. And here's the most racist backward group of people doing this. Um, let, let me just expand this broad, more broadly. Um, the tobacco industry gives money to as many people as they can. Um, some of us are involved in a campaign to stop people from taking tobacco money. And unfortunately, many groups, not all groups in the black community take uh, money from the tobacco industry. Unfortunately, we know that the national newspapers, um, editors, um, national newspaper producers association um, ben Chavis, who used to be the um, chair of the NAACP, takes money from the tobacco industry. We know that the National Organization of Black um, Law Enforcement Executives, Noble, takes money from the tobacco industry. We know that NAN, the National Action Network, which um, Al Sharpton has, you know, come out in front and been very open in, in the fight against um, racism and um, for Black Lives Matter. He takes money from the tobacco industry. Um, the, the list, unfortunately, just goes on and on and on. Look at it this way. Most civic, social, political, cultural, and religious groups in the Black community take money from the tobacco industry. Um, there are some good exceptions. Um, the sorority of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated 
um, passed resolutions in 2013 and 2017 to say they wanted they they didn't support or they wanted to get rid of menthol. Um, and then 2017 said that they, their local chapters should um, involve themselves in this. Um, and then in 2016, the um, NAACP um, adopted a national resolution that um, called for their local chapters to join in the fight to um, get rid of menthol. I need to give propers where propers are due. The Delta um, resolution was advanced by Dr. Valerie Yerger. She's a member of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. And the NAACP resolution was advanced by Carol Magruder, who's the other co-chair. I'm one of the other, I'm the co-chair. We're the co-chairs of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, but she led the fight um, to get the NAACP to pass their resolution in 2016. So there are certain groups. Just recently, um, the um, the National Medical Association, the NMA, joined. Um, myself myself and joined um, the um, African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council and Action on Smoking and Health and the American Medical Association to become a plaintiff uh, against the um, Food and Drug Administration um, for, for, for dragging their feet as it relates to menthol. Hey, Dr. Gardner, it's Kathleen here. Um... Charlene got kicked off, so I'm going to hop in really quickly <laughs> while she's a, you know, the wonderful things about technology. <laughs> we have another question from an attendee. It says earlier in the presentation with the Tina Bastos, they were talking about uh, genetics and um, health equity and social justice, all of those things. So this question is, do you feel as if it's genetics that make people more disposed to using tobacco and the side effects of tobacco? or historical trauma and the products that the industry markets to the African-American community? Well, it's certainly not genetics. I mean, I guess there's a, a three-step process. Um, you were drawn into this either as I was by my um, friends and colleagues um, and then there's the great taste of menthol. Um, and then why you keep coming back for more is that you become addicted. And I, I think many people kind of lose sight of the addictive nature. Um, cigarettes are probably the most addictive substance that we know. I mean, everybody talks about crack cocaine this or heroin that or um, whatever. <laughs> methamphetamines and et cetera, it's nicotine. I mean, there's a great article. I, I, I haven't been able to find it in a while and it used probably still in my office because I didn't get to clean out my office that well. A mat, there's a picture drawn in the early 1700s um, at about noon and it shows all these people lying around in some um, city square in some European city, and most of them are drunk. Most of them are drunk. When the Industrial Revolution hit, you couldn't operate that machinery and be drunk. And what was so interesting is that in the 1800s, um, they began to find a, something that people could do that would allow them to get high and work and it was called cigarettes. Um, I mean, it took a hundred years to get cigarettes out of, um, you know, workplaces and out of hotels and out of restaurants. But this, this was quite a finding. Um, so yeah, no, this is about addiction. Um, um, menthol, menthol. Um, nicotine is probably the most addictive drug that we know. Yeah. Yeah. We know it's more addictive than heroin, alcohol, cocaine, all those things. It's terrible. I see Charlene has been able to come back and join us. So I'm going to hop off so she can finish answering her questions or asking you her questions. Sure. So sorry about that. <laughs> but um, on to the next question. 
what advice do you have for a young person that wants to get involved and use their, their, use their voice to create change? I saw that question too. Let, I, 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 I say this a lot, and I mean, I, clearly not to you folks, but look, if you're getting to get involved in the fight against big tobacco, you're going to have to take the vantage point that you're involved in a marathon. This isn't a dash. This isn't a 100-yard dash or a 200-yard dash. <laughs> um, this is one of the most powerful groups in the world. Um, and I think it's the right thing to do, if that's what you, uh, folks are interested in, is to get involved in it and be prepared that there's going to be ups and downs, to put it, put it mildly, backwards and forwards. Um, it's, it's not a linear process. Um, it's not like, oh, you're going to get involved and then two years later you win and then you go on to something else. No, that isn't what's going to happen. Um, and I think it's, um, I think sometimes when we're younger, that's how life kind of goes. But um, if you're really into saving black lives, if you're really into saving um, people of color's lives, if you're into saving women's lives, you're into saving LGBTQ folks, um, Latinx folks, Asian Pacific Islander folks, Native Hawaiian folks, Native Alaskan folks, and all the other people I forgot to mention, then it, 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 it means that you need to take the long road in terms of that. Um, be prepared, keep, you know, keep focused on what you're doing because you're not gonna win every time. Um, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, um, let me stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this act, this question, I'm actually really excited for because this is something that I'm interested in. The next question is: What advice do you have for someone who wants to make a career out of being a public health activist? I think I well I I saw that too. I think it's a great idea. I mean, you get to do, it's about saving people's lives, and folks should if that's what you want to do with your life. I can't think of a better thing to do with your life. Um, you can fight AIDS. You can fight um, nicotine addiction. You 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 can do all of these things. Um, I I I can't I can't think of a I think. When I look at it, you know, what about your life choices? Would, is this what you have chosen to do? Um, yeah, I've been in the fight for Black Lives Matters for over 50 years. Um, and it ends up now it's at the public health level. I, I can't think of a better thing. I wouldn't have done anything different. Not at all. That's really inspiring. Um, and our last question from this list is, what has been your favorite accomplishment in your career so far? I've had a pretty long career, you guys. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that I guess there would be two things I had mentioned. There were a series of conferences that took place in the early 2001 and 2002 and one in 2009. They were called the first and the second menthol conferences. And what we were able to do was bring activists, researchers, um, political figures from all over the country together to focus on the issue of menthol. I think that's why today there are numerous cities fighting for menthol restrictions. Two states have passed um, laws that prohibit the sale of menthol cigarettes. There's a court case against the tobacco industry um, that we're involved with with that. We testified in 2019 on HR 2339, which has been known as the Pallone Bill, that got championed by the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, that actually passed the House of Representatives. Now, of course, it sat on the floor of Mitch McConnell's office. It's still there, and we're trying to figure out where to go from here. 
but I, I, I think there's, there's been some, there's been some good moments. Um, I guess the first moment, you know, I, I, I don't like to dice them up like that. Um, we were called into Chicago in 2013 when the um, health department there and the mayor were thinking of dealing with menthol restrictions. Um, after working there for a number of months and meeting with folks all over the city, particularly in the black community and clergy and folks and doing all sorts of things, Chicago became the first city to um, pass menthol restrictions by putting a buffer zone around schools that you couldn't sell flavored tobacco products. This has, um, of course, gone even further. Today, the standard is what um, San Francisco did in outlawing the um, sale of all flavored tobacco products, um, outlawing the sale of menthol and all flavored tobacco products citywide. And we're doing that in a number of different cities. So there's a, those, uh, those are some of the highlights. Um, I'll stop there. That's really cool to hear about. Um, our next question is from an attendee. And the question is, what does this long-term fight against tobacco look like to you? Will we ever get to get tobacco to be illegal? Well, that's a good question. Um, let, me, let me do it politically for you and then I'll do it. Um, you know, I have a minor in anthropology and I'm gonna to come to that. I have a doctorate in public health and a minor in anthropology. Um, Politically, there's a number of things that come up around the country where they say, well, why don't you just get rid of all tobacco? You know, what's so special about menthol other than it's killing colored people, poor people, women, and LGBT, other than the march, you know, like, why don't we get rid of all tobacco? So this came up first in Beverly Hills um, two, three, three, four years ago. Um, and we suggested to them, let's deal with menthol first and so we can protect the most vulnerable amongst us. And why don't you set up a commission to look into what would it mean to get rid of all tobacco product, you know, stop selling all tobacco products in Beverly Hills. So they agreed with us and they, out, they outlawed menthol um, sales in Beverly Hills. And then eight months later, after they, you know, had numerous meetings on this, they came to the conclusion that we're going to not sell um, tobacco products citywide. I mean, I think there's a, a loophole here and there, but it's probably very a very strong place. I believe Manhattan Beach did the same thing too. So when this comes up, and it comes up often around the country, we have to focus on menthol first because it's attacking the most vulnerable parts. But if people want to go ahead and deal with all cigarettes, then they should take some time and figure out what that what that will look like and what that would mean. That's door number one. Yes. Door, door number two. Let me let me do the second part, and you can um, kick me off oh, after no. this. Um, it would be. It would be. I don't want to say miraculous, but look, we used to drive around in cars without seat belts for a very long time. And now everybody wears seat belts. It's not even a discussion anymore. Um, to get to that type of place um, would take some a serious education. And, and what's interesting, I think the um, COVID-19 pandemic um, allows for some of that discussion to come up. Be aware that human beings have been using products and tasting things and ooh, what is this and ooh, what is that since, since, since they began. Um, I mean, tobacco was first used 9,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Um, it was chewed, then we learned to smoke it, and then, you know, it became ceremonial. Um, I, I'm, I think as a politician, we need to, let's, let's deal with what we have in front of us. And what we have in front of us is the tobacco industry paying, preying on um, poor marginalized communities. Let's take that first step. 
and then let's see what where our next steps go from there. Okay. I completely agree. Um, okay, so unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions. I just want to thank you again, Dr. Gardner, for coming on and speaking with us. We've all enjoyed you so much, and we can't use wait to use all this information for us to grow as advocates. But before you go, um, I would like to ask, how could participants read about your efforts or read about more information about saving Black lives? Um, you could go to um, the AATCLC's website, um, savingblacklives.org. Um, yeah, we had the slogan before the Black Lives Movement um, Matter movement came up um, and look at it there. Um, but I would just encourage people to follow the events do the science, you know, look, I'm, I'm a researcher by nature and I, I would sit at my desk and get into an issue and then you would dive into that issue. Don't, don't just take the newspaper article, look into the science. Once you get to the science, look into the pieces of it. Um, um, if you're gonna do it and I tell this, you know, I, I taught for a number of years, uh, a health disparities class. Um, you want to become expert in some part of it. Become an expert in it. Don't just become a casual involvement in it. Having said that, I'm going to let you guys go. Um, thank you, um, Charlene. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank the rest of you for having me. Hi, y'all. So now after we have learned so much, had so many important conversations, we want you to be able to feel like you have some action to be done. There's always, always something to be done. And what can you do is what you can start with creating your own counter message. So right now we're going to create our own counter message to stop the tobacco industry from profiling. We have talked so much about how it all made us feel, how upset it has made us, how disgusted we are about how tobacco industries target and profile so many different people. So with that being said, we want y'all to take some action and create a 10 to 15 second video that will for one capture the attention. You always, always, always need to have a good attention grabber so that people want to listen to what you have to say. Next, you're going to create a really strong message. And how you're going to do this is that you just need to make sure that you it's something that is interesting to you and something that you know that you can advocate for. And you have to include at least one to two key facts. And so for you, so we can help you, we went ahead and sent you an activity worksheet. So if you want to head over to your email, as soon as I'm done giving instruction, we have sent you all a worksheet in your email so it can help you. We included some key facts for y'all there to help you create your message, as well as including a closing hook. The closing hook should sound something like the tobacco industry and profile is profiling and profiling is wrong because it is. We need a hashtag style profiling and for this to be able to go widespread and for everyone to be able to share it you can post it to our social media post it to your social media and then tag at text to say what with the hashtag stop profiling so that we're able to share it and other people that are in the summit can share your messages hey kiki didn't we actually create some examples to show everybody Actually, now I mention it, we did. Would you mind starting us up? Yeah, I got you. So guys, me and Kiara actually created our own hashtag, stop profiling messages. I'm gonna go ahead and share the first one. For decades, the tobacco industry has targeted the black community with menthol and mint flavored products. Today, one out of 10 black youth use a menthol or mint flavored product. The tobacco industry is profiling and profiling is wrong. Hashtag stop profiling. Guys, just like in this message, like Kiara was just saying earlier, it has a hook and it also has a fact and a really strong message. Not to mention that the ending is very strong with how we ended that Kiara was saying is a great example. The tobacco industry is profiling and profiling is wrong. And don't forget to use that hashtag. Kiki, do you wanna go ahead and share yours? Yes, I'd be more than happy to. 
let's say you go up to someone, how can you get their attention? You can go up to them and be like, hey, did you know that for decades the tobacco industry has been targeting Native Americans with all natural cigarette branding? Today, Native American youth have the highest rate of cigarette smoking. The tobacco industry is profiling as, and, oh my God, sorry, and profiling is wrong. Hashtag stop profiling. Obviously, sometimes you're not going to say hashtag in real life, but this is really important so that you can connect messages to other people. By making this hashtag, you all in the summit, whether you're in the same city or not, could be connecting each other's messages and sharing their stories. Again, make sure that you use your resources. We have sent y'all some key facts as well as a couple of outlines that y'all can use if you have any questions. Take our examples and take them into action so you can make your own message. Okay guys, so lucky for you guys, we're gonna go ahead and bring up the very first slide that we showed. So that way you guys can see what your 10 to 15 second video will have and it will, what will it consist of. That includes, again, something that captures the attention. You're gonna create a strong message. You're gonna include one to two key facts, which just to reiterate what Kiara said, we also emailed along with the registration link, documents that have key facts that you can use to prove we to create your own tobacco industry, like to stop them from profiling. Then don't forget to use the closing hook or the closing hook that we use, which is the tobacco industry is profiling and profiling is wrong. And don't forget to post it onto social media and tag us at TX say what, and use the hashtag. What's the hashtag? Come on, I wanna see it in the comments y'all. What's the hashtag? Stop profiling, woo woo, okay. <laughs> so be able to see this hashtag and you guys posting us that way we here at Say What can share it on our social media and let you guys be shown across the state of Texas. So we're gonna go ahead and give you guys a few minutes to go ahead and get this figured out and create your video. And during that time, we're gonna leave this slide up and play some music to help you guys jam out, but also create that video. If you guys have any questions, feel free to go ahead and and chat us in the chat box and talk to us. We'll help you. Good luck. Okay, thank you. So location, location, location. The number of tobacco stores located within an area or community is one of the main reasons why communities of color and low-income communities are faced with higher rates of health discrimination. A recent study by the Campaign of Tobacco Free Kids found that there are more stores that sell tobacco than a McDonald's or a Starbucks. So on the infograph on your left, you see there's a popcorn which represents a McDonald's and there's 31 times more tobacco retailers. That's crazy. Well, they also found out that 63% of schools in 30 cities are within a thousand feet of stores that sell tobacco. And this includes vapes and vape shops. Well, on the next slide, there's a picture of a public elementary school right, right across the street, there's a store that sells tobacco. Well, research shows that the number of tobacco retailers near schools is connected with the increased smoking rates. The same research has been used to try and limit the number of stores that sell tobacco near playgrounds, parks, and childcare facilities. Tobacco stores that are near schools have been shown to have a cheaper tobacco products compared to tobacco stores that are not in close proximity to schools. I think it's the same for vape shops. Limiting the number of stores that sell vape products all, and all tobacco products, excuse me, near youth-friendly places have been proven to reduce the amount of youth tobacco usage in that area. Well, not only this, but also storefront advertising is really important. Advertising on the front of the store is used heavily in low-income and minority communities, and this is not by accident, guys. These storefront advertisements tend to be very colorful and oftentimes display a discounted price. The amount of storefront advertisements in these communities is connected with the amount of tobacco usage in the area. And this ink also includes e-cigarettes. So on the slide of, on the slide, you see the three different um, advertisement and storefronts. Well, on the next slide, there's a storefront. So I want you guys to type in the chat. So pull up the chat box, what's wrong with this picture? Well, I see a lot that's wrong here. And like I see you guys are saying student discount, the student discount, the sign. That's a really big thing too, but also the signs on the back. So the local discount, the e-cigarette um, sign and the e-liquid. Well, I actually seen some of these storefront advertisements in my own community. So what can we do, Micah? 
Thank you so much, Max. So we've learned all about the predatory tactics of big tobacco. So what can you do about it? How can you get involved? Well, earlier you created your stop profiling message and shared it all over social media, and that's a pretty good first step. Next, you can go out into your community and see for yourself the different kinds of e-cigarette ads and discounts. And when you go back to school on Monday, look around and see how many vape shops are near your school and places you like to hang out. All right, consultants, how about you guys tell us about how to do this? So lucky for you guys, say what is the bomb.com. And what we were able to do is to create a vape retailer audit project. What this lets you do, it's a downloadable resource that was also emailed to you whenever you registered for the summit. And what you're going to be able to do is travel through your community. You can make a route. You can do it however you want with whoever you want safely. And you're going to go to your different retailers in your community and see how many stores they have. I mean, not how many stores, how many store frontage advertisements they have. And you can also see how close they are to schools or how far away they are from. You can use this information to help promote activism in your community for tobacco prevention. So that way you can be like, look, there's legit like 15 large signs right here in front of this elementary school promoting the use of e-cigarettes. Is this really what we want to show off for our community? Then you'd be also be able to turn it into say what, then get four hours of community service for using this project. So I hope you guys use it and it's a really great project that we have to offer. Thank you so much, Micah. And guys, we learned so much today and we talked about so much and I hope you learned a little bit and I hope you had fun while we did it. First, we talked about social justice and how tobacco is a social justice issue. Then we took a look at how the tobacco industry has used their marketing tactics to target women, youth, and minority groups. Then we saw how tobacco retailers have infiltrated low socioeconomic communities and flooded the streets with their dangerous products. Lastly, we talked about how you can use your voice to combat the industry from targeting you. So what's next? Creating the first vape free generation is next. A great first step to this is planning out and completing your vape retailer audit projects. Once you complete it and report it back to the Say What staff, you'll receive your certificate for four hours of community service. And I also want to encourage you all, if something in particular in this presentation sparked your intention, do more research and learn more about it. Maybe it's something Dr. Gardner shared, and I also you all to look up and watch Black Lives, Black Lungs. Most of all, don't forget to register and attend the rest of our virtual summits. We're going to be talking about so much more information and we're going to have so much fun. And with that, our summit is concluded. Please, I, I would like to welcome all of our wonderful panelists back on so we can say bye. Bye, everyone. We had so much fun. Thank you for joining. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us. Bye, guys. Bye. See y'all later. See you guys soon. Bye.